Welcome to Multiple Perspectives. I'm David Lofgren. This episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Equity Multiple's Director of Finance and Operations, Clay McMickens. Clay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, David. You're here to share a conversation that you had with a former colleague of yours, David Bittner. David is the head of capital markets research at Cushman and Wakefield, which is one of the largest real estate services firms in the world. But can you set up the conversation for us a little bit more? Like, w- Tell me what David does at Cushman and Wakefield and why you wanted to sit down with him. David joined Cushman and Wakefield about two years after me as head of capital markets research for overseeing our work product as a research team. Um, he sort of led thought leadership content, put together sort of market presentations for the brokerage teams at, at the high level, at the, at the national level, while I did it at more of the local level. Um, he, put, he organized the surveys that we sent to all of our brokers and our investors, put together forecasts, and is really just a guy who understands investment and finance. I think he has probably one of the leading uh, thought leaders in the real estate capital market space. So, you know, I thought it was a natural fit to bring him onto the podcast. Why talk to David now? Like, what is it that you were trying to understand when you were sitting down with him? You know, right now, there's a lot of um, lack of understanding on, on what the what's going on in the market currently and what, what's going to happen in the future. And the beauty of David's job is not only that he has a great great grasp of all the details is he has access to all of the information needed to make these forecasts. You know, he works with the best brokers across the country, um, has access to the best databases in the country. So um, sort of interesting that, you know, he has a longer term view at the market, which, you know, I think sometimes investors and and even me at my job sort of get bogged down in just sort of near term dynamics. So it's, it's nice to sort of have a conversation with someone who sort of says it's important to step back and think about it, not just over the next month or year, but over the next four years and longer. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what he has to say uh, with his broad view of the market. Well, uh, yeah, let's jump into this then. Um, Thanks again for doing this, and uh, maybe I'll check in back with you after we listen to the conversation. Great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thanks for joining, David. Uh, Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, virtually. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Yeah, as everything's happening now, it's all virtual. You know, we spend a lot of time surveying and talking to our clients to get a feel for how they're viewing the market. And I think, you know, even pre-coronavirus, I think there was this sense that we were nearing the tail end of the cycle. Um, And obviously, you know, when coronavirus hit, it really sort of accelerated that. You know, what's your opinion on this? Where do you think we were in the cycle pre-COVID? And and where do you kind of see see us now? Well, I I think that, you know, right up until the eve of the current crisis, we were in a... I would describe it as a mature cycle. Late, late, late cycle presupposes the ending. I, I, don't, I don't think that we can go back and look at where we were in January and say the seeds of destruction were there. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I certainly didn't see them. I mean, I woke up every day trying to find the catalyst. And it ended up being none of the things that I, I thought it could be. <laughs> well, this is normally the case, right? Right. I mean... Well, I, we talk about like the financial crisis as though it was, it was a black swan. That's where the phrase became very popular. It was not a black swan. Like you can go back in the data and see it. It was there. Mm-hmm. In fact, I worked for you know Mike Burry's right hand guy, who was literally pouring through uh, CMBS docs and being like, "This is all screwed up." Yeah, and Mike um, Burry was the doctor made famous by The Big Short, correct? Exactly. Uh, played by uh, Christian Bale. Yes. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that was my boss. That was the guy who was the global investment strategist that I was the right hand to. So like there were people that saw it. Totally. And, you know, and, and it was to be seen. It was not truly a black swan. It was a surprise to most of us. What we're having right now is a true black swan, like coming out of nowhere, pounded in the back of the head. Yeah. You know, I, we were in a mature cycle, which the way that I would simplify that is, is that some you have some markets that are slowing, you have some markets that are accelerating, you have you know a you know a steady stream of jobs 
Um, but you know, you're not looking at it and saying like, wow, we have a ton of untapped capacity in the, in the economy. We didn't have any real issues with inflation. Um, you know, people were constantly looking at asset valuations and thinking they're pretty fully valued. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was a lot of oscillation around that point and, you know, a general uptrend, you know, as revenues continued to grow. So I think it was a very difficult investing environment. And that's certainly the impression you got talking to just about anybody in the industry. Yeah. You're in a world where asset, you know, assets are fairly valued for the most part. And there's a ton of capital chasing every asset. Yeah. And all the deals are not really deals once you have all that capital going after the same product. Yeah, exa- exactly. So we saw, you know, a few years in a row where their, you know, ret- return targets were, you know, gradually coming down. And frankly, institutional investors were aware of that. And they'd be like, okay, I mean, I get it. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, it was, it was, I mean, for us, it was fantastic. I mean, we had year after year of incredible transaction volumes. Um, but it was, it was, it was a tough one for our investors. But, you know, I go back to 20, 2017 and I, you know, my, my big theory at that time, I was like, okay, there's all this money. We're going to see institutions in particular just get more and more aggressive because they're, they're, they're going to face that cash burn pressure. And, you know, I, I was right maybe 20%, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, they, ca- they were very disciplined. Very, very disciplined. Yeah. Very, you know, real living historical memory of what happened in 2007 to 2010. That, that all makes sense. So, so jumping into another topic, you know, part of it, along with our conversations we have with investors, you know, what we've been hearing from a lot of them is that currently, you know, they're more interested in appreciation um, than near term stable cash flow. Is this something you're seeing in the broader market? And what are your thoughts on sort of, what investors should be targeting and sort of optimal uh, investment strategies people should be looking to deploy. Getting a whole bunch of appreciation right now is predicated on the idea that there's a large pricing correction, right? Mm-hmm. Which I don't know if his, his, has occurred yet. Well, this certainly hasn't occurred yet. Um, it's difficult to espy because, look, let me put it this way. If you own like a good bones office building and you went out into the market and took 20% off of the pre COVID price, there's going to be money lined up around the block to buy it from you. There are not that many sellers who are willing to take that right down at this point in time. Got it. So the deals that are going through, you know, are generally showing like fairly minor adjustments to value Based on, you know, maybe dips in the ca- in the current cash flows, you know, we're seeing that on our end. People who are in contract have now seen, you know, price decrease, you know, going back to the sellers and asking for a discounts of 5 to 10%. But it's nothing major where you see these 25, 20%, you know, going back and renegotiating contracts. You know, it's more just, you know, your cash flow has dropped a little bit. And so we want a little bit of a discount, but not totally redoing the wholesale. Yeah, exactly. And I mean... You know, I, I, I've done the math on it. You know, if you're looking, if you're in, if we're talking about like a, you know, good building, stabilized asset, you know, let's say, you know, let's say it has like 12 years of Walt, Mm -hmm. you know, even if rent, even if prevailing rents go down pretty significantly, if you're able to maintain your occupancy, uh, and you know, you figure you're in a, in a monetary environment, environment where, interest rates remain low and that holds down debt, debt, debt costs and could even drive them even lower than they were pre COVID over the next year. You know, a lot, in a lot of cases are not, they're not there yet. It's just, but, you it's know, just I, hard to imagine based on how low they were already. I, you know, look, if, uh, if the 10 year treasury is still, you know, still at 1% or below and the market certainly seem to think that that's the case, then you can lend money, you know, at, sub 3% and have a better spread than you used to have. Yeah, which is pretty crazy. You know, and spreads are everything. I mean, that's that's what, you know, that's the risk adjusted. That is the risk premium that you're being rewarded for taking risk. And, you know, the way the market's priced right now, you either as a lender or as an equity investor, you're being handsomely, re- handsomely rewarded. Um, you know, that's particularly true. And I think this is germane to, 
the increased interest that you, you've told me about that you're having in your platform, it's particularly true if you compare prevailing yields, particularly, you know, you know, like a risk free uh, rate adjusted yields that are available in real estate compared to corporate credit and, you know, and even more so equities. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's 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 very interesting to to kind of project what's going to happen over the next even six to twelve months. But you know, I think for our investors, you know, they are sort of looking for passive income, or they're looking even even for five to ten year holds. And I think just with the instability right now, it's hard to even know what what those time horizons could could really bore out. Well, and that and that uncertainty goes back to why, if you're a seller, you know, there's you definitely didn't want to sell when the debt markets weren't weren't functioning, mm -hmm. um, and certainly a lot of buyers didn't want to buy either because they couldn't get the acquisition financing and didn't know when they'd be able to get it, and you know might be going to try to conserve cash. Yeah. So you know, and even now, I mean, we have a, we have a resurgence of uncertainty now. There's still so little visibility on you know the actual dynamics that are can produce you know per permanent changes in value that we see most people still in this wait and see mode. Um, you know, there's there's definitely an argument for if you have an asset and you really suspect that it's going to end up seeing some large impairments to get out front, you know, before the possibility becomes an undeniable reality. Mm -hmm. um, but in a lot of cases, I mean, I think we're looking at, say, the public markets. And I mean, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'll go look at office REITs, you know, when they're down 25% or so, probably a little bit more now. And, you know, you have to, it, it, it takes some pretty rough math to actually be able to justify that across generally high quality, stabilized, moderate leverage you know, office portfolios. Mm -hmm. So you made a comment about sort of, you know, some, some debt markets tightening up. Are you sort of talking about during the Corona crisis or is this, was that a different period of time? Right, in, in the opening, in the opening, uh, you know, month or two of the crisis, you know, we saw that we saw rapid attrition of lenders willingness to, uh, to put money out. Yeah. And, and have you seen it? Have you guys seen it open back up at all, or do you feel it like it's definitely it's definitely open back up? And I I, I think I, I published a couple of pieces on this. You'll find on our website. But the way it went was, you know, the the, the non real estate markets, the corporate debt markets, and the interbank markets needed to heal before you were liable to see any improvement in in our in our neck of the woods. Okay, and that's precisely what the Fed has been able to achieve by restoring confidence. Uh, through its wide varieties of facilities, um, mm -hmm. as well as its more its conventionally unconventional uh, quantitative <laughs> easing operations, you know, and, and this this goes in terms of the commercial paper markets, you know, returning to functioning, uh, you know, companies stopping drawing on their revolvers, uh, the LIBOR Fed fund spread coming back down, you know, all of those things, you know, are you know improve liquidity through the economy, and as the most direct cognate. Um, we've seen both high yield and investment grade corporate debt spreads come down significantly. And in fact, if you go look at investment grade debt, corporate debt, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all in yield costs are actually below they were where they were pre COVID. And on, you know, and companies have been incredibly aggressive in taking advantage of the renewed liquidity. I mean, we've seen more bond issuance by both, you know, investment grade and high yield companies. Than you know, just about any time in history, you know, I got kind of said before, like markets are all about, are all interrelated. There's, you know, pricing is always relative. So if you're in a world where all of these tenants can raise money, mm -hmm. um, it can't persist that you can't raise money for the debt on buildings that are ultimately dependent on those tenants' credit quality. Right. They are too deeply interrelated, of, of, you know, kinds of risk to be to have highly divergent pricing. So as we saw intervention from the Fed and in the, in the healing of the corporate debt markets, that all but guaranteed that we would see we would see sympathetic action in in the in the CRE debt markets. 
Are there any lenders that are still on the sidelines? Or do you feel like everyone's sort of jumped back into the game at this point? So the CMBS market has has pretty clearly reopened to pr- properties outside of you know the more vulnerable retail and hospitality. So there there have been a number of new issuances with with very attractive executions, uh, particularly for the lower risk tranches. We've also seen life insurance companies who are trading off between CRE lending and corporate lending. Uh, you know, move it, you know, getting much more aggressive to, to, to put out allocations into CRE. Now, where the gap is really has continued to be the bank market, which is very large, very important. Um, and I think it's, I think that that's an interesting case because it, it's not necessarily that they're, they're out of money. Um, the interbank liquid, interbank liquidity is, like I said before, is, is back to normal. So that was definitely a precondition for things, heal, for that sector healing. Right. I think that, you know, part of it, a big part of it is, is that they are focusing their resources on servicing businesses mm-hmm. um, and real and real estate is, is kind of, uh, you know, kind on of the back fe- burner. Feeding, yeah, they're feeding last on that truff. I mean, it was very common to say, to lay it all at the feet of PPP, mm-hmm. um, but we've seen it continue, even though PPP is, uh, you know, a lot of most of most of that work's already been done at this point. Yeah, um, so, it'll be interesting to see as the mainstream lending program comes in action whether that sucks up bandwidth. You know, but ultimately, I I think that there, you know, we're going to see the banks re-enter the market. I don't think it'll take too too long for them to do it, and that's gonna that's gonna be because I think that the risk adjusted returns that are offered by CRE lending are still a bit better than if you're doing it to corporates. Interesting. So I heard you mention that sort of, um, you know, retail and hospitality is is still having trouble finding financing. Do you see them as sort of being permanently redlined in the CMBS market? Or do you do you see a return to be able to finance those back to where we were a couple years ago? Well, permanent's a long time, right? Yeah, of course. So maybe that was too strong of a word. Yeah. Um, no, I, and I, I mean, I think that we should stay in that point. I, it is tempting to see a present crisis as a as a forever thing. Mm-hmm. I think that as you're investing in real estate and not just real estate, you have to remember that eventually it will be 2024. Mm-hmm. And you know, the world will be totally different than it is today. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're we will not be socially isolating in 2024. Oh, I, I mean, and I, yeah, I, the, you know, the, it seems it seems increasingly likely that there's going to be a, a vaccine, um, you know, in record time. And in the meantime, you're going to have more and more cases throughout the population that confer some level of population level of immunity. Mm-hmm. And between the two of those, there is going to be a way out of the hole we're in. And I, I think that that's even true if you ended up, you know, the, the, some of the worst case projections are that you have new versions of the coronavirus every year or two. Um, you know, they'll be able to build on the vaccine technology the way we do with influenza to the point where even then it will be, it'll ultimately become manageable. So you can open the paper every day and see somebody in the news talking about how cities are dead or, you know, no one's ever going to travel again. Uh, I, you know, to believe that you have to believe that people's preferences have radically and permanently changed. Yes. And I, that's not credible. No, I mean, I think there there may be some long term psychological impacts, but I don't think they'll be so drastically different than what people were were thinking previously. I think that's probably a very fair assumption. Yeah. So that that kind of links back to hotels, right? Um, if you're thinking about hotels and if you're thinking about experiential retail, you know, and all the stuff that, you know, was, was doing, was, you know, the stars of retail, they face a tremendous crisis, but a transient one, a one with an end point. And so, you know, there's going to be a ton of focus on cash flow. I, it's inevitable that there's going to end up being, you know, a pretty significant distress cycle with many of these properties. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, but ultimately, you know, for people with the uh, risk tolerance to play, um, I, you know, I, I think there's plenty of people who are going to make a lot of money on, you know, at, at the end of this. Yeah, we, well, we hope so. And we hope we're, we're, yeah. uh, our investors are, are part of the, that winning group. So turning a, a little bit of uh, attention to some, one of the new products we launched, which is um, raising money for different funds. You know, in your opinion, what's sort of the biggest benefit of fund investing versus, you know, direct investments into specific assets? Diversification. I mean, that, you know, first and foremost. Um, but beyond, beyond that, I, he, I, one way I like to think about it is like e- even if your plan isn't to go and buy this massive diversified index like the S&P 500, even if, if you really do believe in that, you know, it's better to have a relatively concentrated portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in, investing is really about having an investment process, a solid process. Um, if you only get to go through that solid process once, like you make, you do all the right, you do take all the right steps, you do all the right diligence, you Check have off the all philosophy, the, the inference. Yeah, you do all the things, right? And you're, and let's just assume that you are really smart, like real, real smart too. Like you're the, you're one of the best at what you do, but you only take one shot. You're limited. I mean, yeah. What well, you still probably have, you know, you know, at least a thirty percent chance of failure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just not not quite getting it right. There are so many factors beyond your control, right? Um, that can that can adversely impact you. Now, if you go through that process, you know, for twenty different investments, then all of a sudden the odds get much better because you're applying a good process multiple times. Yeah, and and I think that the operators that we're working with, you know, people can really trust the process that these guys have because they have a proven track record. That's exactly it. So, so on the institutional side, sort of, you know, what are you hearing from your clients there? I know, um, you know, you work with a lot of these big institutional people. You know, it, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's still pretty early. You know, you can go look at the real time transaction flow, and it's there. Ha- there hasn't been a whole heck of a lot. Um, I think that in the opening stage, everyone was just focused on portfolio triage and now they're starting to, you know, think more and more and look at more deals. I think that if you talk to most investors, they do still have this long-term perspective where, you know, they know the kinds of growth characteristics that create value in a market. And so what, what are those sort of growth characteristics that you think they see just for our, our, uh, investors benefit? I mean, it's, you know, if you're talking from, you know, an office perspective, it's, it's really about, and I mean, this goes out to multifamily and down to retail. It's, it, it's all about where you have high income industries growing and concentrating. Um, because those are the people that are going to be driving, you know, the best knowledge sector businesses. And I mean, and I, I, and I think, you know, in a lot of cases, you end up with cities that are very expensive to live in. But, you know, those reach a point where you start to have demand leakages into areas that have those other benefits, cost of living, you know, the ability mm-hmm. for people who are, you know, well remunerated to buy, a, you know, to, 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 to buy a house. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, there's a steady flow of bodies into a lot of these Sunbelt markets for that reason. And as those people come, they're, they've, been, you know, built and built up the amenities in those markets, you know. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really interesting. So, so segue to to some of my last couple of questions, and I'm, I'm put you on the spot a little bit here. So, over the next twelve months, who do you think are going to be, you know, both property type and market sort of the two biggest winners? I mean, you know, industrial just stands out pretty easily. It, uh, I, I'm not really taking much of a risk there to say that during a time where everybody needs to have everything delivered, that uh, the businesses and properties that do that are going to do are going to do better. Yeah, so you think Amazon will do pretty well over the next twelve months? I take it. Then I think they're going to be they're going to be <laughs> fine. They're going to be fine, and I can tell you that if you go out there with an Amazon tenant industrial deal, uh, uh, we we did, and it it, yeah. it flew. Yeah, not not going to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, and, and then you know uh, any other a second? How about a, another property type that you think you know is poised to do well over the next twelve months? 
Uh, you know, I mean, the other slam dunk, of course, so far has been data center. I mean, hell, you go look at data center REITs, they're up, you know, 20 percent year to date. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what two markets do you see at either gateway or secondary market that you think two, two, two markets that you think are, are poised to, to have a good resurgence? Mm. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that it's, it's, a. Uh, Tricky to say this right now with, you know, Florida and Arizona and Texas. Uh, getting on the chin. Yeah, getting, getting it on the chin. But I do think from some, you know, there's, there's some fundamental basis that suggests that they are overall better, you know, better exposed to recovering quicker okay. this time around. And, and that, that, that just gets back to them being flatter cities yeah. where people drive. Um, you know, pu pu you know, public transit dependency is is going to be a problem with a capital P. You know, yeah, yeah. over the over the over the next year. I mean, even internally, we were you know we we put out a, a survey seeing if people were comfortable going back to the office. And the biggest thing people said is, "Hey, I'm fine to go back to an office. I don't want to take the train every day." Yeah, and and in and in New York City, there's nowhere we can have an office where you know fifty percent of our our team doesn't need to take the train every day. Exactly. I mean, that's, the, you know, another thing I'd even layer on top of that is if you're thinking about work from home, you know, as, as the, as the opportunity cost, right. Mm -hmm. You need to limit the opportunity cost of going into the office. And part of that is this, if you're looking at talking about, okay, I could uh, work from home where, you know, right now, most of my colleagues are doing too. Mm -hmm. um, or I could go into the office you know, and let's even say I don't need to use public transit and I'm going to spend two hours of my day doing that. You know, people are going to do a rational calculus. So if you if, you know, offices and or, you know, markets in general that offer lower commute times um, are probably going to be a lot quicker to get back to the point where it makes sense to go into the office. I mean, another way of putting it is, is that um, every office, every company every individual is going to face this decision of when is there a threshold of people back in my office where the magic starts to happen again? Yeah. Because there is a magic that can happen in a well-run office. That's, that's why we do it. Yeah, no doubt about that. And that's why we're going to continue to do it. That doesn't happen with 25% occupancy. Yeah, or, or some of your team filing in one day and some of the team filing in another day. Exactly. You need, you need to ha create enough of that buzz within your working unit where it makes sense. You need to be able to do face to face and that's going to happen more quickly in markets that don't rely on public transit as much and, uh, and, and have, you know, relatively, you know, acceptable commute times. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a great point and really interesting. So, so last question for you before we jump, I just want you to give us your wild card, your surprise winner, you know, in terms of market and or property that you see next 12, 24 months. Hmm. Surprise one. Something that, you know, you don't think other people are sort of clued into right now. Hmm. I just, I'm so tempted to just say New York because, you know, no one, no one's calling it. And I think there's so much bearish sentiment out there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't know whether that's the 24 months, you know, but there's some, some vagaries around that, mm -hmm. but you know, look, I, I was reading an article the other day with, you know, where a very, very smart, very successful investor thought that, you know, said that he thought, you know, office values in New York are going to be off by 40%. If that's, if that's like, you know, a view, and I mean, you go look at some of the REITs and they, they seem to be in line with that. I don't believe that for a second. Hmm. I don't believe that for, I don't, I don't believe that that's going to be the case. I think that that is wildly pessimistic. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, your initial reaction just to how hard New York City was hit, I think everyone's reaction was, oh, they're never going to recover from this. Yeah. And I think I think that I think that's a, I think that's a, a load of fooey. New York yeah. is a magical place. A dirty but magical place. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm born and bred here, so I have to say I, I, I do agree with the magical, and unfortunately, I agree with the dirty, you know, our, our trash collection has gone downhill. I, I'm, I'm a recovering Manhattanite myself, you know, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's an incredible city. There's, 
you know, it, it, there, there's almost nothing like it in the world. And nothing's been able to beat New York yet. And this isn't going to be the one that does it. Yeah, and, and I love to hear that. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, I think for, for me and I think a bunch of New Yorkers, that's, that's kind of what we need to hear right now. So thank you again for joining. And, uh, you know, I hope maybe we could do this again maybe 12 months down the line or maybe before and see if some of your predictions hold out, hold out to be true. Look forward to talking to you guys soon, guys. Yeah, man. Thanks. Once again, that was David Bittner with Equity Multiples Director of Finance and Operations, Clay McMickens. Clay, thanks so much for bringing this conversation to us. Yeah, of course. It was, uh, it was a good time and you know, it was, it was an opportunity for me to learn myself. Again, thanks for sharing the conversation and introducing us to David and his work. Uh, any last words before we sign off? So yeah, I just wanted to thank David Bittner for joining us. Um, and I encourage all of our listeners to check out some of his research work. You know, as I said, he's sort of the best in class for understanding you know, macroeconomic trends, real estate fundamentals, and any dynamics happening in the capital market space. If you want to learn more about Mr. Bittner's work, or if you want to reach out to Clay or myself, as always, we've got links in the show notes. For Equity Multiple, I'm David Lofgren. See you next time.